Welcome back to Conservative Conversations. I'm your host, Reed. And I'm Frank. Today we're going to be talking about Gavin Newsom as a possible replacement for Joe Biden after his poor debate performance and some results of elections abroad. So let's get started. But before we do, I'd like to remind you listeners to please follow us on your favorite podcast platform and subscribe to our YouTube channel. And also go to Red Circle and become a paid subscriber to access exclusive content. And to start off, listeners, we're going to be talking about the debate between Joe Biden and Donald Trump that happened a couple weeks ago. We won't talk about it too long since it's a little bit of old news, but it's definitely been in the news. If anybody watched it, so like me, I'm sure it was quite exciting. At least I kind of thought it was exciting. I mean, not like super exciting, but it was interesting. Because going into it, at least for me... Because the main focus, of course, has has been on Joe Biden, and I thought he would do okay. Kind of similar to his, what do you call it, State of the Union address, how he kind of did okay. He kind of had some little flubs, but otherwise, he wasn't dead, (laughs) you know. But this debate performance of his was certainly worse than I had expected. Pretty sleepy. Yes. Yes, very much so. You know, of course, if you watched it, anybody you've seen, he wasn't quite with it. He's kind of jumbled his words. He kind of speak nonsensically to get lost in his thoughts. His voice was all raspy and tired sounding. As he does. I mean, if you pay attention, mm-hmm. that is Joe Biden. He, he yeah. was just Joe Biden. Yep. Especially as of late, and you know, one of the uh, one of the big things, my expectations for Trump, I wasn't really, I didn't really have too high of ex- well, I shouldn't really say too high of expectations. I mean, I didn't, I thought you know he'd be Trump. I kind of thought he'd just be his normal self, but he actually kind of exceeded my expectations. He didn't so uh, like. Try to over talk even when his mic wasn't on. He, you know, kept his composure pretty well. Stayed quite professional. Very well. Yeah. So he definitely did better than than I expected, and Joe Biden did worse than I expected. But I'll kind of briefly talk about Trump real quick since Joe Biden's the kind of the big news. But one of the things I thought that Trump could have done better was one particular question. Jake Tapper try to ask what would he do like right now to help people in the throes of addiction and stuff like that when they're trying to talk about I guess the drug crisis and all that right uh Trump kind of kept referring back to the border border. trying to shut down the border to stop the flow of uh, it is a fair point yes that it, it is it certainly is a fair point but I thought he could have answered it a little better because he doubled down on it um, cause I'm pretty sure Jake Tapper, cause he answered it and he still had time and Jake told me he had more time to answer. So he gave him a second chance and he doubled down on closing down the border, which like you said, is a fair point And I agree, but I thought he could have answered it a little better. If I was him, I would have said, well, I'm going to call up RFK Jr. He's a great, wonderful man. He's got a lovely ideas on how to help people going through addiction because he himself has gotten through it and he has a lot of good ideas on it. And I think that could have really helped him politically. He could have won over some people that were planning to vote for RFK Jr. and you know, bring up his name to help help point out the fact that he wasn't on the stage even though he's a fairly viable candidate. He's doing decently well for a third party. But that was really mostly the only complaint I had about Trump was I thought he could have answered that that one question a little bit better than he did. But otherwise, I thought he did pretty pretty good. I'm sure if I go back and listen to the whole thing again, there might be a couple more comments I can come up with. Like, oh, he probably could have done this a little better, that a little better. But overall, his performance at the debate was much better than I expected. I think he did great. And of course, 
uh, like I said, Joe Biden's performance was worse than I expected. I'm sure there are probably other people whose expectations were right on point. Oh, um, yeah. But since that debate, I'm sure it's been the biggest news that there have been plenty of people, even a lot of Democrats and people on the left, calling for Joe Biden to step out of the race, to move aside. And so far, he's said he's not going anywhere. He's in it to win it. Not exact quotes, but basically what he's saying. At least as of this recording. Yes, exactly. Yeah, as of this recording. It very well could change. Who, who knows? But in my opinion, I don't think it will really matter too much because there's talk about well, who's going to replace them? Should it be Kamala Harris because she's the VP and also because it's just easier to do that? Cause well, they, and she should be next in line. Right. That's what a lot of people point out. You right. know, I mean, she's next in line for the presidency as it sits. Right. So why sidestep her if the idea that Biden is supposed to be out? Right. You know? Yeah. And one of the other things is if they pick somebody completely new, the all the money that's been raised for the Biden-Harris campaign is non-transferable. So whoever, like, if they pick Gretchen Whitmer from Michigan, like, that's one of the names that's been floated around. If they pick her, she doesn't all of a sudden get all the you know, donations to the campaign that the Biden-Harris team have been given. They have to raise all, all new cash for her campaign. And you know, that's kind of like a whole big deal. Like they'd have to raise. That's a, a very interesting question. I almost wonder if we shouldn't do a deep dive on that. I mean, what happens to the funds appropriated to Biden Harris then? Uh, good question. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. Like, what what would happen if it was somebody else? Where does that money go? They probably just cash out. Yeah, and go home. Right. Ridiculous. <laughs> Right, but I, like I said, I don't think it's really going to matter too much. One, because if if Joe Biden doesn't step aside, I don't think his you know his poll polling ratings or whatever get any better going forward. If he does step aside, who who likes Kamala Harris? Pretty much nobody. He, right. She exactly. scores lower than Biden does. Yeah, yeah. Some of the polls I've seen, yeah. And if they go for a whole new person, I don't think your average voter is really going to go for it. Like, who's this person on the top of the ticket all of a sudden that nobody even had the chance to vote for, right? I mean, that's how I see it, at least. Like, going back to, like, Gretchen Whitmer, if it was all of a sudden her versus Trump, I don't think your average voter is really going to just go along with it. Like, who is this person all of a sudden? We got four months left, and it's going to be basically a no-name to a lot of people. What's well, interesting. I mean, that's a very interesting question you poise, but, you know, it's happened before. I mean, Obama was a no-named candidate. I mean, but he was campaigning for the whole time, for the whole. Well, you're season. right. You're you're dead right about that. Yeah. But in a certain regard, you know, considering a, a sort of national identity versus a local identity, mm -hmm. nobody had any idea who Obama was. True. I mean, sure, he had the time to go and, you know, campaign around the country, right? Get to know people, so to speak, but nobody knew him. Right. He sort of stole the rug out from underneath Hillary Clinton in that cycle. Right. That's a good point. But I just think with how little time there is left for people to really get to know this, you know, possibly a whole new candidate, I, I just don't think they'll get enough votes. So what, whatever way Joe Biden and his uh, people decide to go, I... I don't think it's really going to matter too much at this point. Well, I think you're hitting on a very fair point because yeah. I, I think the question, the way you're sort of framing it, comes down to how united is the Democratic Party. Right. And they're not. Right. Yeah. I think that's what we're seeing now is they're very, 
ununited. Yeah, that's true. And if they, okay, somebody high up said, okay, it's going to be Gretchen from Michigan. Would mm. everybody just kowtow? I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. So, I mean, it's a good question, a good point that you're raising. Right. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yes, I don't yeah, I don't think it will matter too much. They can they can pick whoever they want for the top of the Democratic ticket at this point, but in my opinion, I think Donald Trump's pretty much got it in the bag at this point, barring I don't know, some unforeseen circumstances, I guess. Yeah. And just real quick, I, before we move on, talking about Joe Biden, people talk about Dr. Jill, Jill Biden, his wife, of course. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, somebody in my family did not realize until I had to tell them that she's not a real doctor. Right, just a PhD. <laughs> yeah, she's a PhD in education, nonetheless. Not even anything good. Right. So in case any of you listeners don't happen to know. Well, that's not to say that education isn't good. Right. Right. right, I know what you mean, but I just want to clarify for anybody who doesn't know us. Right. But uh, Dr. Jill Biden is not an MD. And, uh, yeah, and she's not a PhD in mathematics. She's right. not a PhD in and science. In yeah, some kind of biology or right, whatever. Right. She's a PhD in education. Like, right. do students test better given multiple choice or fill in the blank? Right. Yeah. Um, so she is. She's not a real uh, medical doctor. In case anybody didn't know that, uh, I was su- surprised to learn that somebody in my Family hadn't realized she's not an actual doctor. Well, but, probably most of the nation doesn't. Well, I was, I was kind of getting ready to say it's not necessarily their fault because the media insists on calling her Dr. Jill like it is a, she is a MD or something. Mm-hmm. But she's not. But I, that's all I had. Just wanted to point that out in case there happened to be anybody else who didn't know. Kind of thought, I kind of thought it was funny. Well, I think it's interesting. I'll share an anecdote if, you know, hopefully we have the time for it here, but I'll share an anecdote on that. I had a teacher in middle school, Mm -hmm. middle school. Okay. Wonderful man. Wonderful teacher. His name was Simmons. I don't remember his first name. I didn't know him that well. But it wasn't until I graduated middle school that they gave a special homage to Mr. Simmons and they told us all for the first time, the whole assembly, parents, teachers, everybody, honor students, you name it. They called him Dr. Simmons for the first time. Hmm. And I never knew. It bl- boggled my mind that this humble man, he was very humble. Mm-hmm. He had a PhD in chemistry. Huh. And he was just a humble middle school teacher. Right. He didn't purport himself around as Dr. Simmons to all of us kids. Right. Well, I mean... He was just Mr. Simmons. That kind of shows you the difference between somebody like him and somebody like Dr. Jill. That's right. That's why I wanted to point it out, just Mm. as an anecdote, because people who really know their position, who really know their worth, they don't have to parade around saying, you must call me doctor. I'm doctor. They say right. it's a form of respect. Well, what kind of respect do you need? I mean, mm-hmm. give me a break. You're the president's wife. Wouldn't you get some kind of respect anyway? Right, yeah. Why exactly. do you have to be called doctor on a joke degree or <laughs> joke subject? Right. Well, I mean, this will be my last point. On it. If I'm not mistaken, her PhD comes from like the Biden School of Education or something like that. A college named after Joe Biden because it's in Delaware. So uh, there you go. <laughs> there you go. And you wonder why they call him the Biden crime family. Uh-huh. They make fun of Trump University, huh? Uh-huh. He didn't give everybody in his family a doctorate. honorable doctorate, <laughs> right? Well, well, yeah. That's all I got. Um, go kind of wrap it up, but I don't think any of this mess about getting Joe Biden to step aside is really going to matter whether he does or doesn't. At this point, I think Trump's pretty much got it locked up as long as he doesn't stick his foot in his mouth or anything. 
And Jill Biden's not a real doctor, only a PhD. Right. Well, okay. I think you bring up some really good things in there. Some things I just had to speak out about, but sure. um, I want to backtrack a little and sort of give just my sort of two cents about the debate, if sure. that's fair, yeah. before I lead into my thing. Um, I think that both candidates, in a way, did better than I expected. They both sort of surprised me. Hmm. Most of the surprise to me came from Trump. Right. I thought he would be kind of uh, boisterous right. and yeah. loud and Trump. Uh, He'd be Trump. Exactly. And sort of putting Biden down and mm-hmm. saying some of these ridiculous things. I don't know if you remember one of the first times he debated um, what's his name from Texas? The one from Texas Senator Cruz. Oh, yeah. I mean, he, this man, he called his wife a dog and said he was married to an ugly woman and stuff like this. Yeah. So that was the kind of thing I sort of expected was for him to just sort of be bombastic. In right, character. yeah, that's kind of what I thought too. And I was shocked by how poised mm-hmm. Trump was. And I sort of have a theory that I'd like to share. I have shared it with some of my coworkers in a discussion, but... I think going through these trials, all these trials that Trump has been in, has sort of made him a little bit more somber and a little more sober. Because you can't just sit there in a courtroom and just scream and shout. Right. You know? Mm Mm-hmm. So in a way, I think the exercise of all these fake trials, these trumped up charges and stuff, have sort of made him... Like I say, a little bit more somber. Sure. And I was fascinated and positively shocked by that. He never spoke out of turn. Right. You know, and they set these parameters to the debate that said that the microphone was going to be shut off while Mm -hmm. the other person talked. And a lot of people said that was because of Trump, you know, because of his antics and stuff, if Mm -hmm. you will. But I noticed a few points during the debate where Joe Biden actually spoke out of turn. Now, you wouldn't know it if you could only hear, but you could see it. He tried to speak up a few times, but, you know, he was doing that sort of ghost whisper thing because he had a cold, Uh supposedly. So you didn't hear it. Right. But he tried to interrupt Trump a couple times. Right. If I were a image and digital master i would show you i'd sit here and pull the the video and present it for the audience but you'll just have to take me on my word it was something i noticed that biden was the one actually speaking out of turn a couple of times right the other thing that i was sort of interested by is i thought that biden would have been much worse now you know everybody in the left-leaning media has woken up like you say, like you outlined, there's been all these calls for Biden to step down now for people right. to realize, you know, for pe- people have woken up and realized that he's not as strong and presidential and with it as they've been <laughs> claiming. Right. And that's like one of the craziest things, in my opinion, because one of my best examples, if I can get clips, I'll have the links in the show notes, is Joe Scarborough. Yeah. Like a month or so ago, maybe two months. Yeah, he said this is the best version of yeah, and, Biden there's and ever F been. You, if you can't handle the truth that he's the most with it president. Right. Well, and then the day after the debate, it's the complete opposite from Joe Scarborough. He's like shocked and surprised and how how could this be the what the president's like? We didn't know. Yeah, Yeah. right, you didn't know. You're covering for him, people. Well, and that's what's really interesting to me. I mean, it might have to be a different segment for a different day, but right. I feel like there's more meat on the bone than that. Yeah. Because, to me, Biden has always been joke Biden. Mm-hmm. A joke. Uh-huh. This is a man who, I mean, even back when he was vice president under Obama, mm-hmm. he used to say the most outlandish things. Yeah. There used to be a moniker for him. They'd call him Grandpa Gaff. Right. That was when he was vice president. Right. His whole term during presidency has been one 
laughable instance after another. Right. Totally laughable. And so that's where I say, to go back to my original statements about this, I was kind of shocked by him too because I sort of expected him to just be falling down, not even be able to stand at the podium, not be able to stand up straight for 90 minutes. Hmm. Not Now, he wasn't as big of a joke as I expected. Right. But that's why I feel like there's more here. There's there's an undercurrent that I can't exactly put my finger on because now everybody's shocked and awed. Mm-hmm. Well, they're pre- pretending to be, at least in my view. Right, but that's sort of what I think is interesting is they were pretending the whole time yeah. and he's this great man and mm-hmm. now they're pretending to be shocked that he's not when... He never has been. He's always been a joke. Right. Like if a, you remember the first time he ever ran for president, he oh, had to like back out because yeah, because he's a big phony liar, right? Yeah, and that's not liable or slander. I could say it and print it. Right, it's true. Mm-hmm. He's a phony liar. Right. So come on. I mean, it's amazing. I actually think he did slightly better than my expectations. But one of my favorite points, just to hit this before I go into my thing that I wanted to say, is my favorite point of the debate was when Trump said, what are we even standing here debating? Right, yes. Uh He said, my campaign was, my presidency was better. The the country was singing. We Mm -hmm. were doing so much. We were doing so well. We had so much money in the coffers. We were bringing in so much tax revenue. We were doing this and that and the other thing. Right, yeah. What is there to debate? Right. That is my favorite thing because there are things that Trump could have said that I wish he said. Sure. But that one, that's something I would have said myself. Right, and he even kind of doubled down on it a second time by saying, "Like, I wish he was a good president because if he if he was, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in Mar-a-Lago or some yeah, one of my some, places, some beautiful place, yeah. relaxing right now." But he's doing so bad that he feels like he has to come out and run again to help save the country, in his view. Yep, and I think that's spot on. Yep, I think so too. Because, I mean. It it is true. Like he doesn't have to do this. What? What other uh, than him believing he's out there to actually help the country does he need to do this for? It's not like Trump has to go run for office to make a bunch of money. He's already got a bunch of money. Well, you know, and it's interesting because I didn't see us going into this, you know. But one of the questions about the immunity case is interesting too, because if he wasn't going to run again. You know, he said he's running again because Biden's running again mm-hmm. and sort of a vice versa, so yeah. to speak. Well, one of the things that historically has always happened in questions of presidential misconduct is usually the sitting president forgives the prior president. And we've never really gotten into this pickle before where they're trying to put a former president in behind bars. Right. <clears throat> I think one of the reasons why we saw the the Supreme Court have to make the decision that they made as either controversial or non-controversial as you may see it is because Biden hates Trump. You know, they're really going after each other. Right. And we've never really been in a situation like this before. Right. Yeah. So I think that's interesting, too, is, you know, you have two men who I don't think would be running if the other man wasn't running. Yeah. I In a certain regard. Sense. Yeah, right. right. <clears throat> yeah, definitely. That's interesting. Well, anyway, to get over to the other point that you brought up, which is a very interesting one, and I have a few points to say, one of the other names, you know, it's not just Harris, and it's not just Whitmer, and it's not just some of these other names, but a big one has been Gavin Newsom. Right. A lot of people have proposed that shiny boy, as I've heard some people <laughs> call him shiny mm-hmm. man whatever he's shiny he you know he sort of looks good he's clean cut he's handsome you know i've heard people call him ken a ken doll sort of yeah i mean he's sort of this handsome character um a lot of people have put his name forward he does lead one of the largest economies in the world mm-hmm. 
state of California. But I don't see that as being viable. And I wanted to outline some reasons why. I wanted to pick on him. Sure. I'm sure if I wanted to pick on Gretchen Whitmer, I could come up with some points. Okay. I'm sure if we wanted to talk about Hakeem Jeffries, I could find some points. But Gavin Newsom in particular, that one has really struck a bell with me because I've heard so many stories recently coming out of California that just make me think, well, how on earth could Gavin Newsom be promoted to president of the country? Right. And one of them, I'm sure a lot of people will remember, but, you know, they just did this minimum wage increase out Mm. in California. Mm -hmm. And there have been so many jobs lost. Yeah. And so many restaurants have closed. Restaurants that have been in their neighborhoods for 50, 60 years have gone out of business. They've lost more than 10,000 of these minimum wage type jobs because of this increase in wages that California put through. Hmm. You know, it was so bad that the California Business and Industrial Alliance, called CBIA for short, put out an advert, (laughs) an advertisement in USA Today with mock obituaries for some of the popular businesses that had closed in the area. Hmm. Can you believe that? I've seen the image of it. Yeah. And it is interesting. It's, it's not an obituaries page because it's not in the obituaries section, right? But it looks like an obituary. Hmm. They do obituaries for the, all these local restaurants that have closed that are no longer in existence that will never come back. Probably. Right. You know, we're talking about 10,000 jobs or more. That may never come back. Right. Because of the minimum wage. Okay, now you might say, you know, he didn't put that in there. He's not in the Congress of California, X, Y, or Z, but he's California's leader. Right. He's the executive. Exactly. He could have vetoed it. Mm -hmm. He could. He has a lot of power. Right. You know, and he's right on board with this stuff. Yeah. Another interesting point is that State Farm, and of course the links for these things that I'm citing are going to be in the show notes just to say, but State Farm, you know, the insurance company, Mm -hmm. they, along with some others, there have been others, like for example, I'll just mention this quickly, but like Allstate and Farmers Direct, those are two other companies that have sort of pulled out of California. Well, State Farm now is demanding to California that they're going to raise rates 30% for homeowners, Mm. 36% for condos, and 52% for renters. Wow. And that's already on top of the increasing prices of insurances. That's their point, is they're going to raise these rates or they're going to pull out. Mm. They're basically putting... Uh, Newsom on notice, California on notice. Mm-hmm. You're either going to pay these increases or you're not going to have State Farm in the state of California right. anymore. Right. Now, some people, I mean, you know the left, the liberal left, and, you know, maybe you might even just say ignorant people in general. I'm not saying ignorant in a bad way, but just ignorant of markets, ignorant of prices, ignorant yeah, of... Yeah, people who just don't know. Yeah, people who just don't know. Well, the cost of building has gone up. This has Mm -hmm. been reported on. We've talked about it on this channel before, but throughout the pandemic and stuff, you know, the price of copper piping has gone up. The price of lumber has gone Mm -hmm. up. On average, from 2019 until the present day, building costs, like if you had to rebuild your home, are up 31%. Mm. So let's just say to use easy numbers you know something like a hundred dollars let's say your house was a hundred bucks it would now cost a hundred and thirty one dollars to rebuild your home right so do you see i'm sure you see my point but i hope that the general person could see my point too i mean costs are up across the board right 
and you have all these issues out in California. Right. They've had some flooding that was out of season. Mm-hmm. They've had wildfires. They're always having wildfires. Right. And they're They've, having, I feel like I, they just recently announced that people have to cut back on their like air conditioner use or something like that. Energy. They yeah, have all yeah, these just, energy yeah, problems. Energy use. Yeah, they have their rolling brownouts. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Mm-hmm. And so if you take all of this into consideration, you know, if something were to happen and you call on State Farm, just as the example, because they're the one making this, you know, known. Mm-hmm. If you had to call on State Farm to rebuild your home, well, guess what? It's going to cost 31% more than your home is valued at. Right. To rebuild your home. That ha- cost has to come from somewhere. Right. <clears throat> There's also an interesting thing where all of the crime out in California. Oh, yeah. You know, there's been all these stories about how many Rite Aids have closed and CVS's have closed mm-hmm. and whatever. I mean, I don't know that I have the examples exactly correct. Once again, you can see the show notes, but there have been so many stores that have closed. Yeah, because of the big problems with theft. Theft, yeah. And I crime, think- I mean, whether it's just, what do you call it, when you just destroy a property just to destroy a property. Vandalism? Vandalism. Whether mm-hmm. it's just vandalism or it's straight up theft, you know, they're coming and stealing your product, the mm-hmm. assets that the store has. There's been a huge problem with that. Right. And so one of the proposals, doesn't this sound fruity and nutty, I just like wait. California? Some California lawmakers have proposed that if a grocery chain or a grocery store is going to close down a location, they're going to pack up and move. Mm-hmm. Well, they're trying to make it law that they have to give six months notice to the public that they're going to close, and they have to explore, not the state, not the community, but that chain has to explore options to replace the store with a, a different supermarket somehow. I mean, how does that even make sense? It- Makes no sense. So if Walmart's going to close, they have to use their resources. They have to give six months notice and then give their resources, even though they're being stolen from every second of every day during that six-month period, Uh they have to spend more resources to see if maybe a Kroger or Target (laughs) will come in. Yeah. Yeah. uh, We're going to leave... In six months, but yes, we'll make sure Target's going to come follow right behind us. I, yeah, what, what right. business is going to want to This do location, that? this place, is so much crazy stuff is happening that we're going to move, but just wait. There's going to be a Costco here tomorrow. Yeah, uh-huh. yeah right. Yeah. It doesn't make it. I mean, these people can't. Oh, they, they're in La La Land. Right? Well, they are. That's what they call that place out there. What are they thinking? I mean, and truly, when I read this, I mean, you know I'm sort of black and white thinker, but Mm. I would think, okay, well, what's the fine? I'll just pay the fine. Yeah. Screw it. Screw the six months. Screw the vetting the next company. Screw it. Just pay the fine. Let them find me. Cost of business. I'm just shutting down. I don't care. I'd be out tomorrow. Right. (laughs) You know. I don't want to curse on on this, but sort of F it, you know, F it. What the F are they thinking? (laughs) Right. I mean, that's, I'm, I'm, I've heard stories in the past, like one that long ago, I think at Walmart in Chicago, like one of the heavily like black populated areas of Chicago, the Walmart decided to leave. It might not have been Walmart, some big store like that. And everybody's blaming Walmart for leaving, despite the fact that they're losing money because people are stealing from them all the time. That's not the problem. The problem is Walmart's leaving. Right. (laughs) How evil. That evil Uh corporation. Yes. I know. I mean, it's so silly. The last thing that I wanted to mention was, it's just an anecdote, and I have to caution. This is the biggest caution that I can give during this particular episode of this particular segment but it's an anecdote given by a lady i will try 
even harder to find the link. But before we went to air, I couldn't find the link. But I know what I saw, and I know what I heard. <clears throat> but it was an anecdote by a lady who lives in Oakland, and she claims that she knows Gavin Newsom, that they're family friends. They know each other. But even she came out and had to say, she had to say, that the local hospital, I don't even have the name of the hospital, because like I said, this just was an anecdote that I heard on the internet. It was like on YouTube shorts. And I watched so many of those, it's hard for me to go back and find the link, you know? it's. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but she was talking about how the local hospital in Oakland where she had her kids. Things are so bad in Oakland now that that hospital won't allow their staff to go out for lunch. Hmm. Now, she doesn't work at the hospital. She wasn't talking as a staff member or anything. Right. But she was basically just saying she's, she's somebody who lives in Oakland, grew up in Oakland, had her kids in Oakland, and knows Gavin. Mm -hmm. And she said things are so bad now, not just in in Oakland, but you know her her point was about California, about right. Gavin. Right. I feel like I've heard something kind of similar, like some big business in like San Francisco has been warning their employees not to go outside for lunch unnecessarily if they don't right. have to, stuff like that. Right. So I hope it tracks. And if I can't find the link, I hope our listeners will forgive me. You'll just have to believe me that this is something I saw with my own eyes. I, I'm not claiming to know the lady's name. I don't know the hospital's name. Right. I don't, you know, I'm not trying to claim too much, but it tracks in my yeah. opinion. Right. Things have gotten so, and she brought up Governor Brown. She said, you know, we just had Governor Brown and he wasn't that bad. Things were doing good in Oakland. Right. And these are things I wouldn't be able to say. I don't live in California. I don't know. Right, yeah. But she brought up these things. She has lived there all her life. You know, the, things have really gone south with Gavin. Right. Well, they have been because we there have been, certainly been reports about how the, the population in California is declining. More people are moving out and they're moving in. It right. costs more to rent a U-Haul out of California than it is to get one to go to California. Right. And whether or not, you know, I don't want to debate. I just want to point sure. this out. But I mean, because you might argue just to clarify what I want to say here, but you might argue that there's more influx of illegals, you know, true. Yeah. I don't know. So you've, if you really want to talk about just blunt bottom line population i don't know what the statistics are maybe true. maybe that, that what you're saying point. is not true but if you want to talk about tax base you're dead accurate yeah yeah right. the tax base is leaving right i think that's a better way to put it yeah <clears throat> so i don't know just the idea to me that gavin newsom would become the president of the united states mm -hmm. is laughable yeah Right, I, I think so too. It's he is does not really have the proven record to go national. I mean, I think the only thing he can run on is if you like how California looks, I can make that the whole country. And hopefully, people are wise enough to say, "Well, California is not looking that great these days." Well, I hope it's a good example just to bring up what you said, the point about the tax base, since we agreed on that. Right. Where would the tax base of the United States go? You'd be fleeing the United States. Yeah. Who wants to do what has been done to California to the entire United States? Mm -hmm. Please no. Right. Come on. Yeah. Come pass. on. Pass. Mm -hmm. Hard pass. So I just want to make those points. I mean, I don't know how many people are really saying Gavin Newsom, and I don't know what kind of a chance Gavin Newsom really has. But... Right. If you're a wise person, a thinking person, Gavin Newsom should have zero chance. Mm -hmm. In my opinion, other than being Nancy Pelosi's like nephew or whatever he is, and being relatively handsome, if you see him that way, what what is there going on there? There's nothing going on. Right. Exactly. He's it's it's amazing how he's so popular and 
the Democrat Party, but I guess it's because he toes the line. I guess that's all it takes. I suppose. I don't know. I don't know. It's a very corrupt either. party. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, you got that right for sure. Uh, well, is that all you got? I suppose. I mean, I kind of wanted to hit on, you know, there have been a few elections happening abroad. Oh, yes, I could yes, just go touch on very briefly. I don't want to spend too much time on them, but... Sure. Um, you know, India just had some elections. I'll just try to rapid fire this, like shots out of a shotgun, you know, because I really don't want to spend too much time on them. But India just had elections and Modi gets to keep his seat. Some people thought that was going to be pretty contentious. They thought he might be upset, but mm-hmm. nope, he gets to keep his seat. But his party did not win enough of a majority to govern outright. Hmm. They only got 240 seats when it takes 272 to have a majority. So they're going to have to make some alliances to remain in power. Mm -hmm. So maybe that's something we'll follow up on. Don't want to spend too much time on it. But in order to keep power, he's going to have to sort of give up a little bit of power. You see what I'm saying? In France, no party has enough of a majority to win a consensus to form a government. So Hmm. that'll be interesting too. That's interesting. I hadn't heard that. Yes, there's going to be, there'll be links in the show notes. I'm not making this up or anything, but it could spell trouble, you know, especially because we've seen uprising going on Mm -hmm. in Paris. You might argue that there's always uprising going on (laughs) in Paris, but... The Olympics are about to be there. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. And there's been a lot of trouble. And the, the, the fact that no party, you know, they thought for a few days that the right wing was really going to take power uh, in the first round of voting. Mm. The right wing really got big numbers. But then in the second round and so on, it's kind of dimmed and as i say the line that i'm going to use here and that's going to be referenced you can find the reference is no party has enough of a majority to win a consensus so it's going to be interesting to see i mean it almost seems like paris is a hotbed of activity right now Mm -hmm. like we're sort of who knows what's going to happen right uh so Thought I'd just mention that for anybody who's interested and maybe that's something we'll follow up on, you know, in coming days. We'll see how that shakes out and who actually does get power and whether or not a consensus is formed. You know, I think it's kind of like the India thing where a couple of parties are going to have to sort of join forces if they want a consensus and want to be able to pass things. The last thing I thought I'd talk about is that the conservatives or... Tories, as they're called in England, are out. And the Labour Party has just had a big victory in England. Have you seen that headline? Yeah, I've heard a little bit about it. Well, one of the interesting things that I thought I would just mention, and there's going to be a link to this where the person I'm linking to does a much better analysis than I'm going to do here, but there were some really interesting results um, some people say that the fact that labor has replaced, uh, the Tories, you know, given their prime minister, don't have his name right now, Indian fellow, I mean, I don't want to come uh, Rishi off. Rishi Sunak. Rishi, yeah, Rishi, very good. <clears throat> They're calling it sort of replacing one with another. You know what I mean? That there's not really too much going on. But oh, uh, I'd just like to say I believe I actually just named the mayor of London, if I'm not mistaken. Not no, I think you're state. right. Really? I mean, maybe our listeners can re- correct us, but Rishi sounded correct to me. I mean, it was an Indian type guy. Okay. I don't want to come off as racist or anything. I mean, sure. I doubt our listeners would call me racist. I just I don't have his name written down. But whoever the current, as of this recording, prime minister is, he's an Indian guy, but he's a conservative guy. But he hasn't been very effective right? as a conservative. And so some people are just saying it's sort of swapping one name for another, mm-hmm. so to speak. You know, mm-hmm. one party for another. So Labor, Labor's taking over now. 
but <laughs> might as well have been labor before, right. some people are saying. Right. But one of the interesting things is that there's a guy named Nigel Farage. Oh, yeah, that's what I was going to mention here in a second. Yeah, and if you've been around the block, if you've mm-hmm. been studying politics for th- the years that we've been studying politics... Nigel Farage is not a nobody. Mm -hmm. He's been around. And he came out for whatever reason. He formed this Reform UK party. Yeah. And it was sort of like at the last minute with like only one month to go before the vote. Right. And one of the interesting stories is how successful he was. Now, some hateful person might say he wasn't successful, and that's fine. Right, because I I don't think they really picked up any seats or anything or something like that. They didn't win, so... That's one of the interesting things, though, and that's what I wanted to get into is you can follow the link just like the listeners can. Mm -hmm. The the person I'm going to link to does a much better analysis of this than I'm going to, but here you go. Nigel Farage's Reform UK party even though they were just created like a month before the vote. Mm -hmm. They had basically no money, no budget, no candidates in waiting. Mm -hmm. They came out third. Hmm. Third in the overall vote share. They got a total vote of 4,087,896 votes, which was 14.3% of the vote. Hmm. That's pretty significant for a yeah, party that was bad. only created a month, a month yeah. before the vote. Right. Okay. So just let me compare that real quick to, there's also another party called the Liberal Democrats. They got 3,497,877 votes hmm. or 12.2% of the total vote. But if you look at the seats one, there's a huge disparity. So do you see the difference in numbers? One is 4 million, just over 4 million. Yeah, difference of almost 2%. One is three, about 3.5 three million. Right. So Nigel Farage's party won half a million more votes than the liberal, liberal Democrats. And like you are picking up on, a little more than 2% of the total population right? or total vote share. That's a better way to put it because maybe the entire population didn't vote. So total vote share, they right. got more than 2%. Well, guess what the disparity is between Nigel Farage's share of seats in the parliament versus the little liberal Democrats? Um... Just take a guess. Let me put it this way. Let me frame the question a little bit better. For Nigel Farage's party, they got 4 million votes. How many representatives do you think equate to that 4 million votes? How many representatives in their parliament Uh. (laughs) for 4 million voters, individual voters? Uh, Probably like 50? Four. Oh, just four? So that's one seat. Per million? Per million. Okay. Now let's flip the coin. For the Liberal Democrats who got three and a half million votes, how many seats in Parliament do you think they won? Uh, at least two. Well, no more than two. One? Just one? 71. Oh, what? Well, how does that make any sense? Exactly. Something fishy going on, huh? Hmm. Wouldn't you say? I mean, it seems like it, but I'm certainly not a bref- Is that the right word? Familiar with the, the parliament system over there. I think you meant to say a breast or something. I yes, don't know. something mm-hmm. like that. I'm not sure exactly either. I mean, I'm not going to sit here and purport to be an expert. Right. But it does the, seem strange. The person that I'm linking to is a UK okay. person. They live there. Mm-hmm. So for them to point, I just took down these numbers because the disparity in numbers is astounding. Yeah, it seems like it, yeah. Astounding. Mm. (laughs) 
I mean, this is the type of thing where I would be petitioning for, I don't know, whatever you can do, legal reviews, uh, mm-hmm. recounts, What I don't know. Hmm. I don't know what you can do. But, but just to shore up, just to finalize, Labor did get 34% of the vote, and they got 64% of the seats in Parliament. Hmm. So I don't know how well all those numbers track. But it does seem like the Reform UK party got severely slighted. Yeah. Well, part of what about it is um, like one of the reasons why Nigel Farage created the party is because a lot of the people who had been voting for or voting with conservatives, yeah, the Tories, they're tired of them. They weren't, you know, being all that conservative or whatever it's, it's right. they had issue with. So that's why Nigel Farage felt like he had to create this new party. Yeah, and that's what I think is interesting is I hope people will follow that link in particular. I think it's very interesting. It goes to Paul Joseph Watson. Mm -hmm. I I don't really want to call him out. Not a sponsor, you know, and all that. (laughs) But I do like him. He puts out some very good material. He does a great analysis on this. And he opens, I don't know if, it's copywritten or whatever, but he puts out that song. It's a popular American song where it goes, um, Welcome to the new boss. Same as the old boss. You'd recognize the song if you heard yeah, it, sure. I, I guarantee you. But that's how he frames the whole episode that I've linked to, is that right. you're just swapping one thing for another. Right. Well, I mean, not to drag it out too long, but that just kind of makes me think of in Mexico. They just recently had their election. They have a new president down there. But some of the complaints I've heard is basically kind of the same. It's the new boss, same as the old boss. Mm -hmm. It's not really going to make a difference because they have similar beliefs and the cartel cartel runs the place. Yeah. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. It is interesting, and it's something we've seen before in this country, too. You know, Mm -hmm. a lot of people are jaded on both sides of the aisle because Mm -hmm. no matter who you put in power, it seems like, you know, like Trump says, there's this sort of swamp that surrounds D.C. Right. Where these other actors call the shots, not really the president. Right. Mm Mm-hmm. So it is, it's just interesting, but I just wanted to point out the numbers of it. Because when I saw the numbers, 4 million people are represented by 4 seats in Parliament versus 3.5 million people are represented by 71 seats in Parliament. Right. How do you make that math work? Right, well, just based on the numbers, it certainly... Sounds totally lopsided and uh, ridiculous. Yeah, screwy. Like so there's something going on there, but uh, but I get what you're saying. Right. Who knows what the what you the makeup of these right. counties or these right how they do municipalities it or, whatever. or whatever? Who knows how it's distributed? Right, right. Yeah. I understand your your point, mm-hmm. but it just seems crazy when you right, talk yeah. about. Total percentage of vote share, right? It seems off the charts, right? Yeah, definitely, definitely. <clears throat> yeah, that uh, that will be something to kind of keep an eye on. Our closest ally and former motherland, or whatever you want to call it. Well, our closest ally is Canada. Just point that out. Well, I guess geographically, yes. But even by GDP, Canada beats UK. Oh, okay. Well, I guess I'm just speaking more historically. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, that's an interesting, interesting story. I believe it was our last episode we briefly talked about some of these elections over in the, in Europe. Well, and there's more to come, oh, I'm yeah. sure. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and like I said, these are developing stories in a sense. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And yeah, we'll definitely keep an eye on those. Um... Well, is that all you got for our main story? That is, finally, that's all I got. Well, then, listeners, we would like to encourage you to go to Red Circle and subscribe for our exclusive content so you can hear the exclusive segment that's coming up next. 
Well, listeners, if you enjoyed this great conservative conversations, we hope you will go follow us on your favorite podcast platform. You can find us on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, and many more. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Just search at Conservative Conversations 92. Also, stay tuned for some content coming from the Republican National Convention as we will be live on location in Milwaukee next week. And we would greatly appreciate it if you go to Red Circle and become a paid subscriber to access our exclusive content. You can usually hear extended segments and special episodes just for subscribers. That's right. We hope you might share us with a friend or two and recommend that they become paid subscribers so that they have access to the same exclusive content that you have access to. And as always, we thank you for listening.